Hello and welcome to Useful Idiots. I'm one of your hosts, Katie Helfer. And I am the other host, Darren Matte. How are you, Katie? I'm good. You? I'm great. And just want to remind people that to get bonus content, you can sign up and be a useful idiot at usefulidiots.substack.com. You already get extended interviews for being a subscriber. We're also offering you access to the Absurd Arena, which is where you can leave comments and interact with us and other useful idiots. And you also get access to uh, the Thursday Throwdown, where we provide you um, your midweek dose of media madness, because just making fun of the media on Monday mornings is not enough. So we do another thing every Thursday here at usefulidiots.substack.com. Yeah, and we got great stuff for you. You're really going to love it. You're going to see Brianna Joy Gray get into it. That's one of the things we react to this week. Uh, but yeah, definitely we're giving you even more reasons to become subscribers at usefulidiots.substack.com. Uh, there's really no reason not to do it except for peer pressure from people like Pod Save America who are threatened by us. <laughs> Speaking of that exclusive content, we have a question from our absurd arena. Now, this is something people can access they can read it if they're not subscribers, but if they want the chance for us to actually read their question, they got to be subscribers. So what do we got today, Wilson? So the first question from the Absurd Arena, Soda Popinski asks, with recent federal court cases upholding a state's right to fire public employees for boycotting Israel, do you think we're entering a new era of state-sponsored foreign-controlled censorship? Huh. I mean, I don't know. A couple things. One is I don't know if it's a new era. And the other thing is... I don't, I, I don't know if it's foreign controlled. I mean, it's up to the United States whether to do this, right? Like the United States is choosing to do this, even if it's on behalf of Israel, whatever that means. Uh, and so I think that we should just, the buck stops here, the buck stops at the United States. And if the United States is doing it, I don't think we should even, we don't even need to make frame it as a foreign controlled thing. What do you think, Aaron? Yeah, I think that's right. We're doing it. And the reason... It's so sensitive around Israel is because Israel is such an important client state to the right. U.S. And so Israel serves a certain geopolitical function for the U.S. And that makes the U.S. Uh, very um, reactionary on anything to do with Israel. It's not Israel telling the U.S. what to do. It's, Isra it's the U.S. using Israel for what it wants to do and then clamping down on anybody who questions that orthodoxy. So, yeah, but I do think we are entering into a very uh, scary era of censorship overall. And we're going to talk more about that today. Yeah. Perfect on our main question. show with uh, with uh, talking about a major expose in The Intercept about uh, increased government control and regulation of speech. And shout out to everyone who's fought against that loyalty oath. Shout out to people like Abby Martin, who actually sued the state of Georgia when they tried to force her to sign uh, a contract, sign something in her contract when she was just going to speak at the University of Georgia. There was language in there saying that she would not engage in uh, or promote BDS, and she sued them, and she won. All right, who do you got next? So next, in these turbulent times of nuclear war and crazy midterm elections, Mo asks, at 74, I want to know if Aaron and Katie have learned to stop worrying and love the bomb. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I am still worrying, and I'm not loving the bomb. That's my answer. Yeah, I'm also still worrying and not loving the bomb. Uh <laughs> But uh, I guess I do try to not think of it. If I thought of it as frequently and relentlessly as I should be, I think I'd just be curled up in a ball in a corner. So can't let that happen. All right. Well, thank you for the great questions and keep them coming in the absurd arena, which you can access at usefulidiots.substack.com. Should we get to our four food groups? Yeah, let's do it. So for Democrats Suck, we have Democratic Congress member Tom Malinowski of New Jersey. And he was questioned by uh, journalist Michael Tracy about a measure that he introduced declaring Russia a state sponsor of terrorism. And the question that Michael Tracy put to this Congress member, Tom Malinowski, is, well, are you concerned that your measure would criminalize and make impossible diplomacy with Russia, which could have very horrible consequences given that Russia is the other major nuclear power? And this was Tom Malinowski's response to Michael Tracy. Congressman, the bill you introduced to list Russia as a state sponsor of terrorism, doesn't that abrogate any hope of diplomacy? Go, go enjoy your career for Russia today, man. We're, uh, we're talking Excuse to me? people on Halloween. We're going to have to stop. Excuse me? Congressman, did you accuse me of working for the Russian state? Can you please get out of my way? No, I won't. I'm going to walk on the public right of way. 
Congressman, you just accused me of working for the Russian government. Congressman. <clears throat> Congressman, you, you accused me of working for the Russian government because I asked about a piece of legislation that you sponsored. That's incredible. And here you are as this self-proclaimed expert for State Department alum, you know, aunt, friend of Antony Blinken, and you can't even ask, answer a basic question about a piece of legislation you introduced? That's utterly absurd. I'll, I'll, I'll ask it again. I'll ask it again. <clears throat> doesn't, doesn't your legislation to make Russia a state sponsor of terrorism along with Cuba and North Korea and Iran, doesn't that abrogate any prospect of diplomacy, Congressman? It's amazing you would think that would have to be a question backed by the Russian government. Wow. That's even more pathetic than I could have imagined. Unbelievable. Wow. Ask a Congress member about a piece of legislation that he is sponsoring, and he will accuse you, if he doesn't like the question, he'll accuse you of working for the Russian government. That's so disgusting. <laughs> yeah, but also funny, too. It is funny, but it also is infuriating that people are used to getting away with this and they do get away with this. And this is the type of stuff that you, Aaron, in particular, are always talking about, which is the Russiagate uh, narrative being weaponized. You're just allowed. It's just such guilt by association. First of all, he's not even at RT. Yeah, no, uh, Michael Tracy has never worked for uh, the Russian government and neither have I. But that doesn't yeah. stop us from being accused no, from of being, it. Right, know. accused of yeah. it, yeah. But I mean, even if if let's say he did work for RT, that's still a reasonable question. But he doesn't oh, work for RT, is. which makes yeah, it course, all yeah. the more ridiculous that you just can't. And the truth is, you can't answer that because the the question to that is obviously yes. You know, shout out to that to that congressman because usually they would just say something like uh, Putin's like Hitler, so we can't, of course, have any diplomacy, and we're with the Ukrainians, and we will fight until you know they declare victory. So this is, I like that this is a congressman who's basically using the argument that we see from online trolls. Yeah, and great job to Michael Tracy, by the way, for holding his ground and for asking an, a question about uh, a congress member's own legislation and the question of, you know, how this measure of declaring Russia a state sponsor of terrorism will impact the prospect of diplomacy doesn't really occur to most, you know, mainstream journalists because they don't care, really care about diplomacy. It's not really on their mind. Right. They're only vested in encouraging confrontation. So this is a rare case where someone asks about the prospects for diplomacy as a result of legislation like this, and they get accused of working for the Russian government for it. It's, uh, it's a great illustration of how things work, as you say. Awful. awful. Yeah. Well, sh again, thank you for to that congressman for being so uh, overtly disgusting. And thank you, Michael Tracy, for asking that question. So what do we have for Republican suck? So for Republican suck, we have a great campaign ad from Michelle Steele, who is a very right wing member of Congress uh, in California's 48th district. And she is being challenged by Jay Chen, who is a lieutenant commander in the U.S. Naval Reserves and a Democrat. She, by the way, has broken some glass ceilings. She is the uh, highest ranking a uh, Korean American office holder and highest ranking female Republican officer office holder in California. Obviously, because she's broken glass ceilings, she understands how important representation is and uh, uh, diversity and equity. So we're going to see her commitment to these values in uh, this ad that she made about Jay Chen. I am Michelle Steele. I approve this message. This Jay Chen for American Congress? He's perfect for China. Chen spent thousands of dollars bringing Confucius classrooms to California. Chen brought Chinese propaganda into American schools on purpose? Exactly! He's one of us! A socialist comrade who even supported Bernie Sanders for Supreme Leader. Sanders loves Mao, Chen loves Sanders. Jay Chen, he's perfect for China. <laughs> I am Michelle Steele. I approve this message. So I don't even know what to say about that ad, except it's racist, xenophobic, stupid, uh, misleading, just gross. So often these ads read like parodies of what people would do if they wanted to make fun of racists in yeah. the Republican Party who have a real animus toward China. Democrats have Russia. That's their main focal point for hatred. And Republicans are more China hating. You know, that's the diversity of our political system is haters of Russia or China. And yeah, that's just outright offensive. And uh, so offensive. and also reads like just a parody. It's uh, yeah. 
Yeah, it's so racist. Yeah. Uh, and he, of course, his his major crime is that he is the uh, son of immigrants from Taiwan. That's what makes him suspect. Disgusting. 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 Yeah. All right. So for isn't that weird? We're going to go into think tank world. And there's all these different think tanks who have millions of dollars from NATO governments and weapons manufacturers and other big corporations to uh, take part in online seminars and put out papers and pontificate about what to do about the problem of free speech and people uh, in the in our free world talking to each other. And their big concern is that all this is a, a groundswell for disinformation. So how can they police that? Well, that's what think tanks are for. So here's one fellow with the Atlantic Council uh, sharing his thoughts in a uh, online panel about how he wants to um, basically spy on immigrant communities in their uh, encrypted communications to police uh, misinformation, alleged misinformation. So I'm a resident fellow at the Digital Forensic Research Lab at the Atlantic Council. If we had unlimited resources, one of the biggest shortcomings that exists in study of disinformation in the U.S. context is lack of good monitoring of what goes on in encrypted platforms, particularly WhatsApp, to an extent WeChat. When we talk about misinformation that's spread in immigrant and diaspora communities, a lot of it never really enters broader public awareness because it's restricted very much to these platforms. The only good way to monitor these platforms is to have an active presence in the channels in which this information is spread. That's been tough for researchers to establish. It's not going to happen in the next 80 days. So that's something where we will be very reliant on tips from partners and from concerned citizens who might see particular narratives developing, which, uh, you know, if we have more information, we can go in and look at it and help contextualize it. But we can't do that on our own at this point, I think. So first of all, anytime someone tells you that they're a resident fellow at the Atlantic Council, that should set off alarm bells. Uh, that means that they're there to promote ideas like this, which is basically spying on immigrants in case they say the wrong things. And I just love like the glee with which he uh, shares his big idea to basically uh, monitor immigrant communities in their uh, WhatsApp messages. And I also, I just love you saying it's like five ladies. He's like one guy and there's five ladies there. You can see he's like, I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm reading too much into this, but you can see that I, I just sense a, a certain titillation at being able yeah. to like share this with a group of ladies. He's the one guy like, hey, ladies, guess what I got? I got an idea to spy on low income Im immigrants. Right. <laughs> What's your sign? <laughs> but yeah, that's like what these think tanks are. On the beach. That's what these think tanks are for. Uh, exactly, uh, ideas like this. Yeah. So yeah, that's my uh, weird. Well, yeah, it's your weird. Although the scary thing is, I don't even know how weird it is. That's what's scary. It should be weird, but isn't that the, isn't that typical? It's very no normal. Way. It's true. Yeah, it's very normal. It's, it's a new normal. Yeah. So for isn't that terrible? I got a story now. I think we can just play the videotape, but but just as a setup. Uh, this is from a documentary. Now, I know a lot of people, we live in a society where um, being uh, well endowed, um, having a large member uh, is considered a, a gift, a plus, a benefit. Uh, but apparently there is another side of having a big penis. And we learn about trials and tribulations faced by well endowed men on this show. Uh, Channel 4, British television network, Channel 4 has this show called My Massive C-O-C-K. And here's a clip from that uh, very enlightening uh, uh, show. I went for this interview and I thought the interview went really well, but suit trousers are well fit in, very tight. The response I got was, you're not going to get the job. We thought you were a good candidate, but we thought there was inappropriate behavior happening. They thought I had an erection throughout this whole interview. And they were very much like, your attire wasn't right. They clearly meant, you know, we could see you. So I should add that uh, the penis that is uh, sported by this man is nine and a half inches. And in the video uh, and in also in the in a photo that accompanies this article, you see him standing there with uh, lime green boxers. He also, by the way, has to have specially custom made uh, underwear so his penis doesn't fall out of them. But uh, I don't know. How would you describe this? It looks like a football. It's a huge penis. That's what that it's is. A That's a penis. massive That's penis. How it. Yeah. That's how yeah, I describe it, it. Oh, my yeah. God. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, the gift and the curse, you know, the gift yeah. and the curse. Right. He's gifted by our creator, but also it's a curse because he got right. denied a job just because of the He couldn't help it. And yeah, also, he's, he's a really skinny. He's a really skinny guy, too. 
So if maybe if he was a little bulkier, it would it would yes, maybe be you're right. more proportional. But he's yeah. Are you yeah. body shaming him? Or are you saying it's he? I'm not body shaming. I'm I, I, obviously up? no. How can I not be impressed with a nine and right. a, whatever it is inch penis? So that's really half, impressive. Yeah. But maybe I'm just, I'm, start wearing kilts. Uh, yes, but is he of that culture? That would be you know cultural, cultural appropriation. appropriation maybe. We don't right. know if he's yeah. Irish. Sounds uh, British. Actually, uh, Aaron, that would be Scottish. I can. Oh, Scottish. Sorry, it's sorry, everybody. Erased Scottish sorry. culture. I, I guess they're up. all the same yeah. to you. All no, the they're not. People. No, no, they're not. All the no, people not. colonized by by England. Yeah. That is uh, anyway. That is a tough predicament, and uh, that is terrible. Yeah, that is. Terrible. But also a gift, you know. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully, he'll have to. Yeah, I I wonder how it affects his actual. Well, we're gonna have to watch that. Maybe we can do. We can watch some of that that uh, show. But we've shown you enough. Yes. And if you're not watching the video, it may be worth it just just so you can see what this thing looks like. Well, so for this week, we have uh, a stone moment from our stoner in chief, uh, yeah. President Biden. All right. So President Biden spoke at a rally uh, this week and he dropped a bombshell about his uh, education days, his uh, his background. It's great to be at Florida Memorial University, one of the nation's great HBCUs. I'm a big fan of HBCUs. I got my start at one of those other HBCUs, Delaware State University. Okay, that's pretty good, man. Anyway. <laughs> okay, so HBCU, as people probably know, historically black college or university. So Biden, I guess, uh, I don't know what happened exactly. Either he... Uh, Either that that university was actually a HBCU and we didn't know about it, or he forgot, or he's lying. What do you think? Of course, he's just joking. Well, you know, recall he said that uh, during the 2020 campaign that if you don't vote for Biden, then you ain't black. That's what he right. told Charlemagne, right? right? So he's drawing on his uh, fictional history at an HBCU uh, to, right. uh, you know, to make that judgment. That is a, a stone moment indeed. And people were just going with it. And I think when you're listening to Biden, if you actually reacted the way you would to a, a a lie or a senior moment, you just be reacting constantly throughout the entire speech. You'd be like, what, huh? So people yeah. just roll with it or else they'd have to constantly interrupt him. Yeah, look, on the question of, you know, is Biden lying or just having a, a moment uh, of cognitive decline? He's been lying his whole political career. Right. There was an incident in the 1980s when he was caught uh, plagiarizing his stump speech about his life from a uh, British politician. Right. So no this is, I'm going to go with lying and just having a predilection for making things up without even knowing what he's doing, possibly. I think that's, I mean, I think that's a realistic assessment. That's a fair assessment. Yeah. When Debbie and I passed this law, it included everybody, not just seniors. And so what happened was we said, okay, you know how much it costs to make that insulin drug for diabetes? Cost. It was invented by a man who did not patent it because he wanted it available for everyone. I spoke to him. Okay. So that's Biden uh, speaking uh, in Florida, saying that uh, he spoke to the man who decided not to patent uh, insulin because uh, he wanted it for everyone, which is very admirable of this of this person. Uh, and Biden says he spoke to him. But the only problem is that Dr. Frederick Banting and Professor John James Richard McLeod, who were awarded the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1923 for their 1921 discovery of insulin, uh, were uh, died before Biden was born. So it's not really possible that he spoke to them. Unless Biden has, uh, you know, psychic powers and can speak to That's the dead. That's true. Right. That's true. He could. We can't be, rule that out. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. We can't rule that out. Yeah. President Brandon the Stoner. President Brandon the Stoner. Yeah. All right. We have a great guest this week. Yes. We are so excited to be talking to Ken Klippenstein. He is a DC based investigative reporter who focuses on national security. He's also an avid Freedom of Information Act requester. He is at The Intercept. And prior to being at The Intercept, he was the nation's DC's correspondent. And Ken has a new article that he co-wrote along with Lee Fong. It's called Leaked Documents Outline DHS's Plans to Police Disinformation, DHS's Department of Homeland Security. All right, let's go to Ken Clippenstein. Ken, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. 
You have a really huge scoop out uh, based on a lot of internal documents from the Department of Homeland Security, basically showing that the disinformation governance board that got a lot of attention uh, a short while ago when Nina Jankowicz was appointed the head, that even though that was shut down, that the essential work of it is continuing. Can you lay out for us uh, your your findings and uh, what these documents that you obtain reveal? Yeah. So when the disinformation governance board was shut down uh, to, you know, cheers on, on the part of uh, civil libertarians in the Republican Party, who I thought were sort of dancing in the end zone about having shut this thing down, uh, because, you know, I had sources within DHS very quickly tell me, uh, you know, that was the, the the governance board was just a sort of centralized, formalized head of the system at the headquarters level of DHS. That's not the entire that's not like the tentacles. That's the octopus's head. So at the um, level of the child agencies within DHS, uh, they told me that they were still doing a lot of the same stuff. Now, taking point is uh, the agency called CISA, which is under Department of Homeland Security, it stands for uh, Cybersecurity an infrastructure security agency, they uh, stood up a unit called the misinforma- uh, MDM team. It stands for misinformation, uh, disinformation, and malinformation. And so through this office, which is about, I think, two dozen people, um, they've been liaising with a number of uh, big tech firms, and uh, they're very careful. You know, what they would say is, we don't actually mandate anything be taken down. We just give our recommendations. And so they are recommending to these social media firms uh, content that they think is dangerous. And what I found over the course of the story is that um, this stuff began in 2018 um, and has sort of gradually swelled and, and proliferated sort of to cover more and more uh, topics. At the at the very beginning, I think the, the kind of like origin point for all of this was the 2016 uh, Russia disinformation scare that led to you know, a, a response from the federal government saying, okay, well, you've got this disinformation problem. It's DHS coming to them saying, well, um, here comes midterms 2018. What if we stand up a, it was called the Countering um, Foreign Influence Task Force under DHS. And the FBI actually has it almost identically titled one. So it was this very quick push to say, okay, here's the solution to your uh, 2016 uh, disinformation problem. Um, but the only thing is that by the time 2020 came around uh, and coronavirus and it expanded to include content considered to be uh, harmful with regards to the you know, coronavirus vaccine, the pandemic, and then now under President Biden, it's continued to expand to encompass things like I was sort of surprised by, by uh, you know, how, how broad it's getting, the withdrawal from Afghanistan and um, U.S. aid to Ukraine. Um, and so it seems to me that there's just this gradual march where, where the purview of this uh, disinformation units that are again peppered around different um, agencies throughout the federal government seems to just keep growing. You know, one point I've tried I've tried to make for a long time is that um, all the fear mongering about Russian disinformation is itself a disinformation campaign against the American public because if you look at the content of what Russian actors actually put out, it's uh, mostly dumb memes that nobody saw. And sure, some Russian propaganda sites have put out false stuff, but it's a uh, the idea that it's impacted society as a whole, let alone even one person, I think personally is massively overblown when you look at the actual content of what Russian actors are alleged to have put out. And it's been used to justify uh, what we're seeing now and what you've revealed, which is an increased effort by the government to police information and to suppress uh, discussions of issues that they don't like. And one of the examples you you um, cite is you know criticism of Biden's policy in Afghanistan when the withdrawal went so awry for the Biden administration. So can you tell us more about how this actually happens, how the government interacts with social media companies and gets them to uh, take action on content that the government deems to be disinformation? Yeah, as recently as this summer, um, they were having biweekly um, Zoom like teleconferences um, between FBI, DHS components and other federal government agencies that the story just didn't have the, I mean, the story is like already 12 pages long. I wasn't able to explore all the different agencies that are contributing these things, but it's really broad. And so in these meetings, they kind of lay out what they'd like and what they claim is that these are just recommendations. I mean, technically that's true. They're not mandating anything, but I mean, at the same time, these social media companies are, you know, lobbying the federal government for preferential treatment. So I would imagine that they're going to care about what the federal government thinks and not want to alienate them too much. Um, But in these meetings, it's gradually become more and more formalized to the point that they actually have a portal where um, the government can, you know, report what they'd like to be, what you know, what they think is disinformation and just send it to Facebook. So it's really interesting the extent to which this started out as a sort of ad hoc effort just focused on election stuff and has grown 
um, and and really uh, crystallized and and created like formal channels of communication that didn't exist previously. Do you uh, distinguish your piece distinguishes between uh, different types of information, right? So there's disinformation, there's misinformation, and there's malinformation. So yeah. I've heard, yeah. I, yeah, I, so this has become ubiquitous within the Department of Homeland Security. It's really strange. You talk to like the source base that I've had, you know, predated this thing. And now that suddenly the it's like a language virus. Everyone's saying it now to describe all these different things. And when you look at the definitions, when you look at malinformation, it, what's interesting is it's not actually untrue. It's the idea that right. you're using information and not providing the appropriate context, which would seem to like involve a lot of discretion you know like how do you define what the appropriate content it's not even that it's untrue it's that right. which you know uh the the veracity of something is hard enough to uh you know figure out but now it's like the context has to be appropriate too um so and, and it, this is being incorporated into you know national security strategy documents at the level of the office of the director of national intelligence and so this is not like while i think um cisa in the MDM team, because of um, the Department of Homeland Security's unique, you know, post 9-11 um, authorities to operate domestically that a lot of the intelligence community doesn't have, at least on paper, um, it, it, you know, it'd be misleading to say that DHS is the only agency involved in any of this stuff. There's all sorts of agencies doing these things, and it's just become sort of like a catechism now. MDM, misinformation, disinformation, malinformation of uh, this lens that they look at these things through. And just so people know, disinformation is when it's... Uh false information spread unintentionally. Sorry. Yes, that's... Disinformation, false information spread intentionally. And then misinformation, misinformation is that it could be unintentional. Unintentionally, right. Yes. Right. And then we have to add malinformation. Who knows? Malinformation. By the time this, is, this uh, show is released, maybe there'll be another classification, another added category. Um, one of the other interesting things I thought was that uh, the Mayorkas, the DHS head, Alejandro Mayorkas, he made it seem like his uh, that that almost like he was trying to prevent overreach. Uh, you have a quote from him. He says it was it was quite disconcerting, frankly, that the disinformation work that was well underway for many years across different independent administrations was not guided by guardrails. Uh, and he he said that the um, role of the board. Right. The uh, right. This so information. Yeah. But yeah. So what he saw the board as and I think this is actually true, you know, I've plenty of criticisms of the director, but I think he's right here. The, that board that they shut down, that was really just the formalization of these practices. And so what he means by guardrails is that they're going to actually establish some formal system around here's what you're authorized to do. Here's what you're not. Here's what these words even mean, because, you know, a lot of these terms lack clear definitions. Um, so, you know, by, by shutting that down. I mean, I, you know, I can understand you hear this very Orwellian sounding title <laughs> and, and you know, the public has this sort of response. But what 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 the public's not able to respond to is the stuff that exists at the administrative level that doesn't have this big, scary name. Or maybe they don't even know that it exists because there, you know, there are features of government that are just not public. Um, that's the sign of, kind of stuff that gets left behind. And I would I, I mean, my view is if you're going to be doing this stuff, you might as well. I think he's right. Like, it, you know, it's a debate in itself. They should be doing this at all. But if you're going to, yeah, you should probably have formal declaration of like what the mission is, like what, you know, what you're allowed to do. And so it's kind of like the worst of both worlds because by, by shuttering that they've continued doing it. They just don't have any clear directives around what it is they're doing anymore. One of the agencies you're profiling here is called, as you mentioned, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA. It's headed by Jen Easterly, who is formerly the, glo the global head of the Morgan Stanley Fusion Resilience Center, whatever that is. And <laughs> your article quotes someone named Jeff Hale, who is a director of the Election Security Initiative at CISA. And he has an interesting proposal, which is one of my favorite things about your piece, where he wants to basically help in, uh, enroll NGOs and nonprofits as what he calls, quote, a clearinghouse for trust information to avoid the appearance of government propaganda. Unquote. So basically, when the government wants to put stuff out to the public, he proposes funneling them through NGOs and nonprofits so that it doesn't look as if it's government propaganda directly. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's sort of central to this whole debate. I mean, there's different versions of what this, I don't know what you want to call it, content moderation can look like. So what we have now is like government involvement with it, which I think people, you know, rightly have a very uh, acute response to. Um, another model is to have private these private groups do it. 
Um, and I guess it's better in that it's not the government. But at the same time, if you look at the composition of a lot of these things, some of the people we quoted in in, in this story that, that work for some of these private firms, they themselves are former DHS. So there's a huge revolving door in terms of um, a lot of these uh, foundations that you think of as just like, you know, the Liberty and Democracy group, like it's just, at, you know, it's just democracy advocates. And then you start to look at the, you know, personnel, the roster, so many of them came right out of the national security agencies themselves. So I wonder if that uh, distinction between uh, public and private uh, bre breaks down at a certain point. What's the origin story of this article? Did someone reach out to you with some leak? Did you decide to look into it on your own? How did it start? The origins are my irritation at the Republicans dancing around it that we've, you know, defeated disinformation. And frankly, that they attributed it solely to the Biden administration when the reality is this started in 2018. President Trump had every opportunity to stop at least the parts that were like, you know, uh, publicly known, which are our parts. And he didn't. And the Republican Party didn't. And um, that's not to say that, you know, there isn't some political dimension to this. But one of the most frustrating parts of reporting this story is is the way in which it's tried. It, it's crammed into this you know, partisan framework that I don't think reflects the reality of that when someone's in power, they tend not to care a whole lot about, right. about free speech. So Trump, so Trump didn't drain the swamp. Yeah. <laughs> Shockingly, no, <laughs> not, not in this case. One of the uh, other revelations you have is that th there was a proposal to basically consider um, uh, countering uh, information that's put out there that discourages trust in the court system and the financial system. Right. Which, yeah, as we stare down the barrel of a, uh, you know, whether you consider a recession now or a recession in the near future is going to have very real consequences. Um, you know, I've been reporting on Federal Reserve policy very recently, and there are people that would call what I'm saying disinformation and right. indeed have who, who work in the kind of economic world. So, um, yeah, that's what made me really uncomfortable about all this is how, um, uh, politically fraught the the subjects that they're looking at. It always starts out with something that people generally agree with. I was looking at polling about this. It's kind of interesting. Um, the polling around um, social media moderation for uh, disinformation about COVID and the pandemic in 2020 was actually enjoyed broad support among the public. And when something like that happens, that tends to have a sort of um, green light effect to the national security agencies to think, hey, look, people are fine with this. What's the big deal? So much of this stuff, this is the point I'm trying to make. This isn't a Biden story. It's not a Trump story either. This is a national security state story because a lot of this stuff is not formalized in statute. There's no law saying we're going to create the MDM team today. They can do this stuff administratively without sign off from Congress. And they have, and they probably have beyond what I'm able to report because I'm, I'm only able to get details that my sources have access to. We don't know what, what else might exist. Um, and so it's, it's, yeah, my frustration with the need to really get into the nuts and bolts of this stuff to understand how is it working? Who is doing what? Because yes, we can look at Twitter and see that, you know, an article about Hunter Biden got locked and, and all these strange things happened. But but how is that being done? Who's executing it? At whose behest is this is happening? And that's really what the story, um, I, I hope, it, it answered in, in, in part, because so much of that is invisible to people. What is going to be the effect of um, Elon Musk's ownership of Twitter, both generally, but also on the story, or is it too early to tell? Well, initially, he had a lot of rhetoric about, you know, free speech, we've got to stop with the, you know, out of control content moderation kind of stuff. But like, just yesterday, I think, or maybe the day before he put out a statement saying that, um, you know, content moderation changes won't be made until we've met with the board or some some kind of board of directors for it. So that sounds like a pretty big walk back from from his initial promises. Um, and just looking at this plan to um, you know, charge people for what is it, the blue checks or whatever. You know, I, I wonder if, you know, his priority in, in, you know, he purchased the company at something that's worth less than, or he, he purchased it at a price higher than what it's worth. So I wonder if he's under pressure to, you know, squeeze some revenue out of it. And I would imagine that, you know, um, stepping back from content moderation is going to spook advertisers and, and, you know, he might find himself, uh, with with conflicting priorities here, if he's if he's if if he's to be taken at his word about um, wanting to want to lift content uh, restrictions. Now the blue check thing, and I think guys, full disclosure, are we all blue checkers? We all <laughs> yes. Blue check? Okay. For now, so, yeah. For now, the blue check on blue check discussion, but we make it accessible for, to those of you out there who don't have blue checks. But uh, <laughs> it's not that people who already have the blue checks can now are now forced to pay if we want to keep them right it's that anyone who pays a certain amount gets the blue check 
Oh, interesting. I, I don't know. I was trying to figure that out. What are you going to do? Are you guys going to pay for it? I might expense it if I can get away with it. Oh, good yeah. idea. Yeah. I, I'm torn. I, I like the blue check, but I just would feel like a loser paying for it, I think. Right. Yeah. I bet it's a personal decision. I, I wouldn't judge anybody for continuing it. I just, for me, right. it's just, just, just to keep a blue check next to my name. I don't know. It's know. tough. It, it does but, provide some benefits, but yeah. I'm yeah. not going to lie, though. There, you know, there's a very classist blue checkist way that Twitter set up where you can check. You can, don't you all do this? You, you check your ads, your, your normal ads, and then right. you check your blue check yeah. ads. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's something to be said for taking that away because who wants to live in a uh, I know two tiered good. system? Right. No, um, I agree. Yeah. One of the uh, revelations you have, you mentioned the Hunter Biden laptop story, and and your story ad advances uh, the saga uh, in that you report that an FBI agent who was involved in getting Facebook to basically censor the Hunter Biden laptop story on the fake grounds that it was Russian uh, disinformation, that he was also in discussions uh, with the with this dhs uh operation that you profile yeah um and you continue to work there which i was sort of surprised by because you would think just out of partisan considerations that they wouldn't want to um antagonize the 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 right by risking having this come out but it shows how little there is in the way of changes to these things when something goes wrong um as i as i remember it was all of these senior intelligence officers signed a letter saying that they believed um, you know, I see this as less of an intelligence community failure, more of a media failure, because if you read the letter closely, the intelligence officers, they were like, this bears all the hallmarks of Russian disinformation. They're very careful not to actually say we have yeah. inside knowledge that this. Is. So they just kind of insinuated it. And at that point, I think the media should have said, OK, well, it seems like they don't actually have hard evidence. And then, you know, you can report that you'd say, OK, it seems like people that are experienced in the field that, you know, have probably worked on this stuff. They think it looks similar, but that's a very different statement than what they went with. And also um, the fact that, you know, uh, Twitter went ahead with locking that. I, I think that we need to talk about the chilling effect that some of this stuff can have, even if they're not, you know, overtly um, issuing a directive, you must take this down. Even just saying something like that, you know, just put yourself in the shoes of a Twitter executive. It's like, well, do I want to be against what these FBI officials say and potentially have news articles come out saying that we didn't listen to their warning? Realistically, I think that's probably going to have some effect. You, even if they're completely cognizant of the um, fact in this case that they didn't actually know if it was Russian disinformation. Well, that's the whole point. And that speaks to the Russiagate propaganda campaign that I was talking about earlier. You can just have people say, if they're formally with the FBI, that this might be Russian disinformation, and that's enough to get everybody into right. obedience. And in this case, I mean, there was a role behind the scenes of the FBI in, in briefing Facebook on uh, a potential Russian efforts to sow discord in the election. And Facebook, whether it was directly told or not, did tie that to this Hunter Biden story. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. That's why it's so useful to say it's straight out of the Russian playbook, because you're not saying it necessarily was done by Russia. You're saying this is something that's typical of what Russia does. It works yeah, every I... time. Yeah, it, it's, it's a flawless tactic. You, you can apply it to anything you want. Yeah. Yeah, I have more. I really have more frustration with the media because there were, you know, there were. I mean, I, I just maybe we disagree about this, but like my source base, I really do think that there was a pretty extensive Russian active measures campaign going on in 2016. We can debate like to what extent that really, really had a material effect on elections and things. So I think they do have basis to worry about it, but it's like the media really needs to be careful in in how they report out what it is is being said it's just so sloppy you know what i mean it's just like a headline like and then everyone gets excited about it there's no specificity that's what i was trying to do with the story it's just like because we get these signs that all this stuff is happening a post gets taken down that's weird um this gets thr throttled you know we can tell all these second order things but it's really hard to know what's going on inside the agencies and you know as i tried to work with sources to find out that's sort of how they're designed they're not really designed to be it's really amazing I, I go to people in Congress that have appropriate oversight of these things, and they have no idea what's going on. It, it, I, this is really, I think, a national security bureaucracy story, but more than it is um, this administration or that administration, because it continues apace. The march continues. It has intensified under Biden, but um, the general trajectory is still in the same direction, and I expect it will be under the next administration, too. And to hear the rest of the interview, please go to usefulidiots.substack.com. That was great. That was great. And we'll link to Ken's article along with Lee Fong in the show notes so you can, so you can read more.
Thanks everyone for watching and listening. Of course, please remember to subscribe to us on Substack. That's usefulidiots.substack.com. You'll get your uh, Thursday throwdown. You'll get the extended full interview with Ken Klippenstein, where he talks about what the CAA got wrong in Russia and how they got it wrong. Also, please uh, subscribe to us and rate and review us wherever you find your podcasts. And of course, please subscribe to us and like our videos at youtube.com slash useful idiots. Join us on Mondays at 10 a.m. at youtube.com slash useful idiots, where we do our Monday mornings, which is a live stream where we react to the Sunday morning news shows that we watch so that you don't have to. And then at 11 a.m. right after that, we take your calls and comments and questions at Colin. All right. See you next week. See you next week. Hello. Thank you so much for listening to and watching Useful Idiots. For full episodes and extended interviews, please subscribe at usefulidiots.substack.com. You can subscribe on YouTube at youtube.com slash usefulidiots for clips, live streams, and full episodes. Also, subscribe to us wherever you find your podcast. Follow us on Twitter at usefulidiotpod and use the hashtag usefulidiotspod. Join us Mondays at 10 a.m. for the Useful Idiots Monday Morning Show, where we discuss the Sunday morning news shows so you don't have to watch them. 